Welcome on behalf of Stanford. I apologize at the outset that I speak no Portuguese. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your being here. Uh, I'm proud that uh, we're able to uh, welcome you. My own background has uh, been as a law school dean here at Stanford, as a provost of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and as president of Indiana University, which is a large public university in, of course, the state of Indiana. I've been on three college boards of trustees. I've written uh, probably too many books. Um, and I've also served in the U.S. federal government in different capacities in five different presidential administrations starting with President Kennedy and Johnson and uh, going forward uh, through to uh, President Clinton. So you can guess whether I'm a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and uh, in the capacity of working for President Carter, uh, when I was uh, theoretically at least in charge of foreign aid for the United States reporting to the President, I visited uh, Brazil uh, several times, and because you've had a long day, I'll tell a little story. My charge from President Carter was to focus on long-term development and on human rights. Our ambassador at the time, uh, which is uh, 1978 or 9, in Brasilia, uh, believed strongly that uh, the foreign aid should be used for short-term problems, uh, particularly ones where he could influence Brazilian policy, no surprise. Uh, and so he and I fought, not physically, but verbally, for uh, the 10 days I was there. And um, uh, at the end, uh, we uh, parted, but we were not exactly uh, warm friends. Uh, he called the staff of the embassy, which were perhaps uh, uh, 60 or 70 of the senior people out, to bid me goodbye from uh, Brasilia. And he knew I did not smoke, and he also knew that I was carrying a small bag and visiting 10 different countries in South America and Central America. And he pulled out and presented me with a very large onyx or a marble ashtray, about this big, and with a great fanfare said, here is a present that we want you to carry. Well, it weighed maybe 30 pounds, more than my luggage. <laughs> and in retrospect, it was pretty funny and clever. But at the time, I was not, uh, not happy. Um, well, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to provide some general background on higher education in the United States, and then focus on two clusters of issues. The first is university governance generally, uh, and uh, what we call shared governance on campuses through the United States. And the second is the roles and responsibilities of administrators of colleges and universities drawing on my own experiences. You no doubt know that uh, public universities on the one hand uh, and private non-for-profit universities on the other dominate uh, the country. Until recently, however, uh, for-profit universities or colleges were growing fast and 
had about 20 percent, one-fifth of all undergraduates. But there was a shift in federal policy just this year that effectively closed some of those for-profit colleges and universities and sharply reduced the population of all of them. And I'll quickly explain why, because otherwise we won't, uh, we won't be talking about for-profit uh, colleges, but rather only public and private, non-for-profit ones. In brief, the source of loans for college students in the United States is primarily the federal government, to a lesser extent, state governments. Those loans enable millions of students. We have 17 and a half million students in this country in college, and they, those loans enable students to go. Uh, and they're available to students at for-profit colleges as well as the public and non-for-profit ones. But fairly recently, the federal government discovered that a very large share of those student loans to for-profit colleges were not being repaid, and that the students who went to those for-profit colleges were receiving little by way of quality education. One of them, called Corinthian, had to close. Another, which may well be familiar to you because it operates in Brazil, the University of Phoenix, lost half its population. It's an interesting uh, case study to me because it was operating solely by getting federal loans in this country while in Brazil, at least uh, uh, for its uh, early years, it had no support from the federal government in Brazil or any of the state governments. But putting those for-profit institutions aside, uh, most private higher education institutions are secular, non-religious, but we have some that have a religion at their base. If you went uh, uh, 10 miles to the south of here or so, you would find Santa Clara University, which is a Catholic Jesuit school. There are a few that are based on race or ethnicity, which is a holdover from the days before the Second World War when most campuses in the country, I'm embarrassed to say, were closed to African Americans and to Hispanics and to Native Americans. And so there are a cluster of institutions that serve primarily uh, those populations, while today every university uh, is required by law to be non-discriminatory in terms of race gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual identity. More generally, it's important to keep in mind uh, that higher education in the United States is not a system. It's a multiple of systems, mainly shaped within each of the 50 states. So it's 50 systems. Um, and we have over 4,100 colleges and universities. Uh, last year they granted 2.5 million degrees. So this is a complex story. Uh, the federal government has a limited set of responsibilities in higher education because most of those responsibilities are in the hands of the states. But the federal government does have three key roles. First, it gives, as I said, grants and loans to students. Not to the universities, but to the students. And the students get to choose where they want to go. 
Um, and virtually every college and university in the country has some students with some uh, loans. Second, a college or university cannot receive a student with a loan unless it has what is called accreditation. And we have a group of 10 uh, major units uh, that do accreditation for colleges and universities generally. And then there are a number of others that accredit business schools, law schools, medical schools, and so forth. Um, but accreditation is essential for getting a student loan. Uh, it's essential to graduate from an accredited school if you expect to get employment. Um, so it's an important step. And in general, every college and university is, needs to be reviewed for accreditation at least every 10 years. The third big area in which our federal government is deeply involved is research support. It goes to a relatively small number of universities. It's really important to know that Stanford is not an example among the 44,100. It's one of perhaps 100 universities that could be called research universities. Um, now, there are various ways to classify colleges and universities. The most common is by the highest degree, uh, academic degree, that they award. Uh, and we've been doing that for the, almost the last 50 years, uh, started by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, which happens to be where I worked before I came back to Stanford. I started here at Stanford, hard for me to realize this, but I started teaching here exactly 50 years ago. So the classification system that we have says there are PhD granting universities like Stanford. Uh, there are master's degree universities. There are bachelor degree universities. And finally, uh, there are uh, associate degree, normally two-year uh, degrees. And they are commonly called community colleges. They are overwhelmingly public. And this is important to stress. They enroll about half of those 17.5 million uh, students. Um, more generally, about 80% of students in higher education are in public institutions. And in total, uh, about two-thirds of our high school students go on to some higher education. Not necessarily graduation, but some higher education. Now, this system that I just summarized very briefly has not been this way since the founding of our country. Uh, it's been developing since the 1600s, and it has been reshaped in very significant ways over the last 400 years. Harvard, uh, the first major university, was started as a school for ministers, for the clergy. Uh, religion was a driving force in higher education until well into the 19th century, particularly uh, Methodist institutions, Presbyterian institutions. Today, that's no longer true. There are certainly some, as, as well as Catholic and Jewish ones, but far fewer. It was in the middle of the 19th century 
that the first seeds of the notion of a research university were sown. But it wasn't really until the end of the Second World War, 1945 and on, that large-scale research universities began to develop, like Stanford. And the driving impetus for that development, there are two terrific seats right in the front row here. Uh, it, um, was uh, the federal government and money from the federal government for research. And federal dollars are the single largest source, by all odds, of research support uh, for those hundred or so major research universities. At the same time, another big change occurred, and that was the millions of American soldiers and sailors who came back from the war, the Second World War, were guaranteed funding to go to college. And that led to an explosion of students in higher education. And that amount, which started with a bang, has steadily increased. And in recent years, the federal government has provided loans for a much larger share of students. And as a result, uh, the numbers have increased even more. But it's against that background, knowing that 50 states in this country are the primary importance in terms of higher education, not the federal government, that I'll take one U.S. state, Iowa, as an example. And I took it because its population is about in the middle of the populations of states in Brazil. It's not at the top, it's not at the bottom, somewhere in the middle. And also, those of you who listen to or read U.S. news know that the very first decisions about presidential candidates for the next presidential election in the U.S. are going to take place in Iowa. So it's in the news. It has uh, somewhat over 3 million people, and there are 60 colleges and universities in that state. Two of them grant PhDs, nine masters, 19 baccalaureates, and 21 two-year institutions. Uh, <coughs> Iowa has what they call a Board of Regents, which is a governing board that oversees the three big public universities, which are called the University of Iowa, Iowa State, Northern Iowa. Uh, each of those private ones has its own board. Uh, and actually, one of the for-profit institutions, Ashford, is the largest one uh, in the entire state. It has about 75,000 students. The University of Iowa, uh, which is the uh, most prestigious of those institutions, has about 30,000 uh, students. The others have less. There is uh, a Catholic institution, Loris College, founded well before Iowa became a state in uh, the United States. Now, contrast that picture with three or so million people with California, which has some 38 million people and 287 colleges 152 public, 133 uh, private, that offer a very wide range of programs. The public ones were organized uh, by what was called a master plan uh, through a, a real 
world giant in the field of higher education named Clark Kerr, and his plan was to rationalize higher education in the state with a three-tiered system, community colleges that would uh, allow anyone who graduated from high school to come, four-year state institutions that would allow the top third of the graduates to come, and ten research universities, University of California at Berkeley being uh, along with UCLA, the two most prestigious, but there are eight others, um, and one was just uh, opened a few years ago. Now, there are 112 of those community colleges, 23 uh, of those state institutions, and I could go on uh, to give the uh, details of the others, but you get a sense of the diversity and complexity of uh, this uh, system. The private institutions, which are mainly, as I said, nonprofit, include some that are two year, but most are four year, and a number have graduate programs, Stanford obviously being prominent uh, among them. Uh, a small share are very restrictive in terms of the number of students they admit. Here at Stanford, for every 20 students who apply, one is admitted. Uh, that's not true at most institutions. Uh, it's the most selective university, uh, along with Harvard and Princeton, Yale. Uh, there are some small what we call liberal arts colleges, by which we mean they're not vocational, at least directly. Most of them don't have uh, engineering degrees uh, or business degrees, but rather they focus on the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences. And students generally major in a subject, sociology, chemistry, history, uh, now, some of the institutions here are linked to a religion, California Lutheran University in Southern California is one of them. Uh, we have some what we call historically black universities. Bennett College uh, in North Carolina, where I had been a trustee, uh, was one of those uh, for African American women only. Uh, when it was started, although now it, uh, uh, it, it too is non-discriminatory. And a few that are single sex, uh, overwhelmingly for women. Mills College is in Oakland, across the bay, and I was a trustee of that institution uh, also. Um, let me turn to how these institutions are governed and I'll use uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania and Indiana University as two examples because those are two universities I know very well, one public, Indiana, one private, the University of Pennsylvania. It may be misleading that it's called the University of Pennsylvania, but it's private. And it was started by Benjamin Franklin, one of our great uh, heroes. Back to Indiana University, it has uh, over 100,000 students. Uh, it has eight campuses, but 35,000 are in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, another 35,000 in Indianapolis, and the others are smaller ones. When I was president there in the 1980s and 1990s, there were three vice presidents with university-wide responsibility reporting uh, to me, one for finance, one for facilities, or one for what we call public affairs, and we had a separate organization for raising uh, money called a foundation 
and we had on each of the eight campuses uh, a chancellor who was responsible for the workings within that campus of uh, some of the issues. Most universities of that size, over 100,000 students, have more than three vice presidents, have a larger uh, administrative structure. Almost all have a provost. I did not want to have a provost because I was hired uh, by the trustees, bless you, so that uh, I could help strengthen the academic institution. And I felt I couldn't do that if I wasn't acting effectively as provost as well. The board of trustees of Indiana University, this may well surprise you, has only nine people on it. Uh, four are appointed by the governor. Four are uh, elected by alumni. And one is a student. And they have staggered three-year terms, um, and that is quite a standard approach for public universities, particularly in the Midwest of the United States. Uh, now, there's some states where Oregon is one, North Carolina is one, where a board has responsibility for all of public education in the state, but not in Indiana where a separate board has responsibility for each of the public institutions. And the board sets uh, broad policies. It is a sounding board for the president. If things work well, the president and the board work together. Uh, as you can imagine, if you're president, as I was, and two or three board members think you're not doing a good job, you're in a lot of trouble because it's so small. The budget, when I was there, was two and a half or so billion dollars. It's well over three billion dollars now. Uh, I should have stressed the most important task of the board is to hire and sometimes fire the president. Overwhelmingly, colleges and universities have an academic council of faculty that sets academic policies for the campus with the president. And representatives of all the schools in the university uh, sit on those councils. Uh, at Indiana, I chaired that council. That's unusual. Most states don't have that. But if we wanted to have a new academic program, we wanted to review an existing one for appointments and promotions, tenure cases, uh, the standards were set by the faculty with the president, but each appointment uh, went through a process that, that included a school review, then a university-wide faculty review in which I participated. And uh, I'm going to contrast that with the University of Pennsylvania. Remember, we have nine trustees at Indiana. At the University of Pennsylvania, we had 56. Most of them were chosen for their ability to give money or to get money. I don't mean to say that's all they could do, but they were uh, very well uh, financially uh, endowed, or they had access uh, to people who were. Now, there were a few, and I was a trustee at the University of Pennsylvania after I had left being a provost there. Uh, a few who were not, but overwhelmingly they, they were, and their responsibilities were not all that different from those uh, at Indiana. Uh, the budget at uh, the University of Pennsylvania is about $6 billion, about 21,000 students. 
The key difference is the size of the research budget, uh, but the same key issues involving hiring a president being the most important, and uh, fundraising. Stanford raises over $1 billion every year. I find that a stunning uh, figure, so if you do too, I won't be surprised. Uh, over a billion dollars. Uh, for the president and the board working together, new academic programs need to be approved, new academic centers need to be approved. Uh, for example, at Indiana University, in the last four years, five new schools were started, including a school of, uh, of global studies. Um, so what does the president do particularly? Well, uh, of course, uh, he or she hires and fires the administrators who work uh, with that president, deals with crises, uh, is deeply involved in major policy matters, a new school, for example, internally. And then externally, as a president of Indiana University, I had to deal with the governor, the state legislature, the close to 500,000 alumni, all of whom viewed Indiana University as their university and felt they should have a say in what went on. Well, that's sometimes hard when there are 500,000 voices, uh, as I'll come back to. Um, the board, of, as I said, hires the president, uh, though usually the search includes faculty and staff and alumni, but the board dominates the search. It sets key policies for the administration, it certainly, uh, at private ones, engages in fundraising, much less so at, at public ones. And the council, uh, as I mentioned, the faculty council, uh, sets policies regarding academic issues, the curriculum, criteria for hiring, uh, for promotion. Uh, and uh, together, that's what we call shared governance. The faculty have a role, the president has a role, the board has a role. Ideally, it works well together. Sometimes those three are banging heads against each other and it doesn't work uh, so well. But an effective leader, of course, tries to be sure uh, that it is uh, working uh, uh, effectively. Well, what about leading a university like the University of Pennsylvania or Indiana University, I came away from my own experience uh, believing that there are three keys to university administration. And incidentally, I found these three pretty much applicable to my roles in uh, the federal government, too. Uh, the first is to focus on two or three uh, key issues at any one time after one has built a group of faculty who support uh, a position on those issues as well as your board. And then you gently and politely, of course, but make clear to the faculty and to the staff that you're there to support their efforts, but only if they support your efforts. You can do that for two or maybe three issues. If you try to do it for 40 issues, it won't work. Nothing will happen. Uh, and unfortunately, too often, presidents do that. Second, I found that you need to spend at least a third of your time on long-range planning. Uh, after the first uh, six months or so, and too few also, I think, uh, do that. 
And third, and this is often the most difficult, particularly in research institutions, you have to work very hard to make the whole more than the sum of the different parts, to make it a real community. Uh, so, for example, when I was the dean at Stanford Law School in 1970, 46, almost 46 years ago, um, we were in the old quadrangle that I think you've at least seen. Uh, most of the rooms in the law school had not been cleaned since uh, Leland and Jane Stanford founded the university in 1890. Uh, it was a mess. And uh, my predecessor as dean handed me a list of faculty. We had perhaps 40 faculty. And he marked 20 of them and said, Harvard and Yale have offers to these 20 faculty, and I think there's a good chance of their leaving. Well, that's not exactly the news that a brand new 36-year-old uh, dean wants to hear. But uh, I realized that in order to avoid that happening, we needed a new set of facilities. And right behind uh, this building are, is the law school that you've walked by, if not walked in. And uh, I worked very hard for one year to raise uh, then $12 million, which uh, was a lot of money in those days at least, to build the four buildings that were the then new law school. And we succeeded in doing that, uh, even though previously the law school had never sought to raise money uh, from its uh, uh, donors or supporters. We also had a student population that was not diverse. There were no Latinos. Uh, there were no African Americans. It was essential to change that. We had no women on the faculty, stunning but true. Uh, we had no non-Caucasians on the faculty, stunning but true. We had to change that. And I said, we're not going to hire any faculty if within the first two years we haven't changed it. And fortunately, we were able to change it. But those are the kinds of things that a dean uh, can focus on if she or he concentrates on just a couple of key things. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was uh, provost, uh, the problems were different. The student body really basically came from the northeast of the United States. And it was clear to me, looking at the demographics, uh, that we needed to reach out across the country. We built a office in California and aggressively uh, recruited students from California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and changed the character of, uh, of the uh, student body uh, quite uh, considerably. Uh, at Indiana, uh, where, as I told you, we had 100,000 students. About 65,000 came from Indiana. And it was important for them to be exposed to a range of different uh, ethnicities, religions. And we worked very hard uh, uh, to try to do that. Uh, and I worked particularly hard to strengthen uh, the teaching mission of the, of the university. Uh, too many of our classes at that time, in my view, were taught by straight lecture, exactly what I'm doing now, uh, which is not the most effective way of teaching. Uh, and we worked hard to develop uh, interactive modes of teaching and learning. Uh, I 
face challenges now and again. Uh, uh, I'm Jewish, and the major event for the fall at the university is called Homecoming. It's a round of football game, and tens of thousands of alumni come, and it was scheduled to happen on Yom Kippur, which is the most sacred day of prayer for Jews. So I had to call the head of the board and say, uh, I suspect you want me at this homecoming with all those hundreds of thousands of people, but I won't be there if it's not changed. And it, and it was changed, uh, but not without uh, challenges. I, I failed in some things. I wanted to, to close some of our regional medical centers for teaching students because they, they uh, cost a lot and they weren't doing a very good job. But one was in the hometown of the head of the state budget committee, and he smiled to me and said, Tom, you're a nice fellow, uh, but if you expect to have a budget, I don't think you're going to close that. Uh, and I didn't. Um, in every job, dean, provost, president, I spent time with a group of staff uh, doing uh, scenarios. What would we do if this happened? If there's a student suicide on the campus, how do we respond? Uh, if we find a staff member has been embezzling, how do we deal with that? Uh, most of the time, the actual ones we did weren't what happened, but the process of reacting quickly, decisively, and we hope effectively to a crisis was very important. Uh, I was also, because I was in those roles, on the boards of a score of organizations in uh, uh, the United States that represent uh, various factions of higher education. And I came to know and see how other universities solve problems, and I would uh, do my best to uh, learn from them and uh, benefit uh, from them. I was blessed. Uh, with my wife to, to come back to California uh, in 1994. I taught then undergraduates in the California state system, that's the public uh, system, for five years, building a network of centers that linked public service to the academic curriculum. And then I went to a center called the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching for 11 years, which is on the Stanford campus, but not uh, part of Stanford. And I wrote books uh, there with colleagues for 11 years before I shifted gears and came back, uh, back uh, this time for the last time, I think. Uh, after 14 jobs, this is it. Uh, but I've had a wonderful ride, and I'm ready now to uh, hear uh, questions, comments, uh, criticisms, even uh, compliments. Uh, what's, uh, what's on your mind about American education? Yes, sir. If you can tell me that A few do. Uh, the question, can they work without accreditation? Effectively, the answer is no. There are a few that do, but they are not entitled to student loans from the government, as I said. They're students. And if their students want to get jobs but have to say they went to a school that wasn't accredited, it's going to be very hard. The few that aren't, that I know about, are religiously based, have a base in religion, and they have a natural body of students whom they may choose from. 
but effectively, no. Other questions on your mind? In comparisons with Brazil or what uh, we can learn? Yes. The American Constitution is it considered a public uh, service in the Constitution? Does this Constitution well, contemplate or is it a public service per se? Not like an academic A wonderful question. Because the word education is not mentioned in our Constitution. Um, and many people, I think perhaps you included, are surprised. Shouldn't it be a basic right like free speech, freedom of religion? And, and the Supreme Court has made a good many rulings about education, our Supreme Court, uh, and they deal with the fact that colleges and universities, uh, with some exceptions, cannot discriminate on the basis of race or gender, ethnicity. But uh, if uh, Tomorrow, the state of Arizona were to say we are closing our schools, there would not be a way for uh, one to say this violates our Constitution. This is not a hypothetical issue because when the Supreme Court of the United States said in a landmark decision, in 1954 that uh, education could not be offered to white people only to the exclusion of African Americans. Schools all over the South, public schools, closed. They said, we're just not going to offer the public education to anybody in our state. Uh, now, what they did, it won't surprise you, is open private schools. And it took a while before the courts said those private schools can't discriminate either. And meanwhile, unfortunately, in one of the tragic uh, eras of American history, uh, many, many uh, African Americans and others uh, who were not Caucasian uh, were denied an education. Uh, yes? I, I would just add yes. that there was another Supreme Court decision in 1972, uh, San Antonio versus Rodriguez, which decided against equal protection under the It had, uh, it's not in the Constitution, but until, uh, until then, Martin's absolutely right. The court hadn't actually said it's not a right, but this time it said it's not a right. And, um, and uh, uh, it's one of the many Supreme Court decisions I regret, I deeply regret. Um, uh, I, not only if we were to redo the Constitution again, which will not happen, would I hope that education would be there, but I, this decision uh, was a particularly... It had to do with funding. Yeah. It had to do with funding. It was about equal funding. But there's still 17 states that equalize funding across the district. Uh, but a number that don't. M most do not. Yes. As far as I know, research universities such as Stanford and others, faculty 
as a great deal of freedom, autonomy to establish academic policies, curriculum. How does that work in the community college level? Uh, another very good question. Um, faculty at Stanford do have uh, f freedom to establish uh, academic policies and practices um, within some limits. They have to be approved by a central faculty body. The provost, who is the chief academic officer, must approve them. And ultimately, the board must approve them. Now, it would be a striking <coughs> departure if the board at Stanford disapproved. However, if you go back to the founding of Stanford, uh, Mrs. Stanford, Jane Stanford, herself personally fired two professors. And that is, in fact, what led to the Association of University Professors that is an organization to protect academic freedom. And that wouldn't happen today. Uh, couldn't effectively happen today. Now to your question on uh, community colleges. There, is a, there are a number of differences. Uh, one is that the faculty at all the community colleges in California and in most of the country are unionized. We have a union, they have a union, and the union does the bargaining with the administration. And that uh, itself is a big shift. Now, a faculty person still has autonomy relatively in her classroom. But in terms of saying, I want to teach more hours, uh, the union would say, you can't do that because we're under union rules. That's a big difference. Further, in the community colleges, uh, most of the students think that they want to go on to a four-year public institution. Most do not go, but they come thinking they will. And so it is important for the four-year colleges, called the California State University System, and the community colleges to articulate their programs so that if I'm teaching algebra at a community college here, you will accept credit when uh, I want to take calculus uh, later on. Uh, so they're much more confined. And also, uh, the community colleges are much more attuned to focusing on careers. Uh, which isn't surprising. Technical careers, here we are in Silicon Valley. If you uh, get a good education as a programmer, you will get a good job. If you get a good education as a uh, uh, reader of uh, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, I hope you will get a good job. You deserve a good job. But it is not always clear that you will get a good job. Other thoughts on your mind? Yes, sir. I heard that the American government is, trying, is thinking about making community colleges free. What is the likelihood of that happening? And what kind of impact could that have uh, in American higher education if they become free? Uh, President Obama has said he thinks uh, that uh, community colleges should be uh, free uh, effectively. Uh, Hillary Clinton, the leading uh, Democratic candidate, has said so. But it is one thing to say that, and it's another thing to have it happen. My own guess is that it is unlikely uh, to have all uh, the tuitions covered 
by the federal government. I think it is, and I hope it is, likely that there will be, uh, if there's a Democratic administration at least, um, which shows again my background, uh, an steadily expansion of support because in the years between 2008 and 2014, when we suffered a great recession, as you did, uh, the funding from states for community colleges was significantly reduced. The tuition that was charged had to be raised to offset those reductions. And that made it particularly hard for economically disadvantaged people of all ages to go to a community college and get a basic education. But I, I hope it will happen, but I don't really expect it uh, full scale. Yes? Total number, half, average, the total number of uh, university students in the U.S., uh, what's the percentage in uh, community colleges? About 50 percent. About half. So I said there's 17.5 million. There are eight or so million who are in community colleges. It's a very important sector. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, a group here at Stanford are working on is how to help strengthen uh, leadership in community colleges because leadership is not everything in a successful community college, but it's obviously very important. And that's, uh, that's why we're, uh, we're focusing on that issue. Yes? Exactly, does a Provence do? What, what does a Provence do? Uh, what is the profile of a typical president? And how are presidents chosen, nominated? Yeah, okay. A Provost, uh, a provost is the chief academic officer. So she or he is the person who leads uh, a search for a law school dean or a dean of engineering. Uh, all the appointments to the faculty, all the promotions, all the tenure decisions go through the provost. Now, she or he usually doesn't do it alone, but rather with some. When I was provost at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with the help of a council, we turned down a number of nominations from departments for promotion to a tenured position. And uh, I believe there were only two cases in which I said, we are going to promote this person in spite of the fact that the department doesn't approve. That was a very rare thing to do. And uh, in each case, there were unusual circumstances. So the provost can say no more easily than, than uh, approve something if the faculty is, is opposed to it, although that can happen. Presidents uh, generally are chosen from within a university, not necessarily the university that they become president for. I was not at Indiana University when I was chosen as president of Indiana University, but I had been a provost, and most presidents have been provosts, but not all. And most provosts, 
have been a dean, but not all. Uh, and the board of trustees has the ultimate authority to choose. And generally speaking, uh, those boards choose someone who has had academic experience. Every once in a while, someone is chosen who is a business person or the head of a philanthropy, uh, but that's a very unusual situation. And in my experience, at least, it works some of the time. Uh, many times it, it's just too hard to step into an academic culture unless you're used to it. You all know well uh, exactly what I mean about an academic culture and how hard it would be for uh, a business person, however bright she or he is, to just walk in and, and be president. Uh, but it happens. Sometimes also political uh, officials. So the other major research university in Indiana is called Purdue University, and its president was the governor of Indiana uh, before, a very able guy. Uh, and, but he had to have a very strong provost to deal with all the academic issues that he didn't know anything about and still doesn't. Yes? With all the experience that you have, plus what you know about Brazil, we have three pieces of advice to give them. Three. I'm not smart, but I'm smart enough to know not to answer that question. Uh, uh, because I know Brazil has gone through uh, a set of uh, very significant shifts, and I really don't begin to uh, know. I read Martin Conroy's book uh, about uh, uh, Brazil as well as China and Russia and India. Uh, but um, be wise, uh, be careful. <laughs> and be kind. That's three. Yes. Last question. Uh, is funding available both for undergraduate and graduate studies here? Uh, yes. Yes. A, uh, you asked about Stanford particularly. At Stanford, a majority of students receive some, uh, some significant financial support. And if their families earn less than, I don't know the figure, but it's a fairly high one, uh, they receive full tuition, full room, full board, and that's a lot of money. That's about $50,000. So uh, we have, uh, for the first time, it, over this past decade, have now a po student undergraduate population that is a, a minority Caucasian. And we have a very wide diversity of students, which was not true 50 years ago when I started teaching here. Uh, and it's also, of course, uh, uh, financial aid is, is uh, not only available, but it's essentially required for our PhD students. Uh, not for our master's students, uh, but for our PhD students. Uh, a last question, if there is one. Otherwise, I thank you for the pleasure of your company. I enjoyed it as I enjoyed my trips uh, to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs>